So how do we fix externalities? How do we make it so that negative externalities go away and we get the benefits of positive externalities? We want to get rid of pollution and we want to encourage basic scientific research. We want to encourage vaccines and these other things that have positive externalities. Um, in general, the main problem with externalities, the whole reason they're an issue, is fairly simple. It is that somebody is not paying enough. Um, if you're a factory and you're polluting, you're not paying for that pollution, and so you're just putting it into the river for free. And so if you want to stop that issue, you have to make somebody pay for it. That's the general solution. If somebody's pay the general problem is somebody's not paying enough, so the solution is make them pay somehow. So the solution to all externality problems is to make it not an externality anymore. It's to internalize the externality or make somebody bear the cost of the damage. Um, so basically, if we think about the chart here, where we have a social marginal cost or a social marginal benefit that is off from what is currently happening in the market, we want to make it so that the world hits that social marginal level. Um, we want to make it so there's less pollution for more expensive, or there's more research for cheaper. Um, and so in order to do that, we have to make it, we have to essentially change the price of polluting or change the price of doing research. Um, make somebody bear the cost of that damage. And if we can do that, then we'll hit the socially optimal level. Um, if we can't do that, then we're stuck in a situation where nobody's paying for um, the damage that's happening. That's why I had you listen to this podcast here about parking. Um, one of the main issues in the United States with parking is that it is free. Um, and so companies like Walmart have incentives to just have massive parking lots and they're mostly empty except for like Black Friday. Um, and every other day of the year, it's just kind of sitting there empty. And it's fine because nobody's paying for it. Nobody's internalizing that externality. It's just kind of there, um, taking up the urban landscape. And so if you want to fix this, what the, the economists that they interviewed here argued is we should charge for parking and make parking more expensive because then that will discourage driving and it will reduce some of the negative externalities that come with additional traffic and additional miles, dri miles driven and additional gas consumed. And so we want to reduce that. And so if we can make somebody bear the cost of parking and of driving, that will naturally reduce that level of driving to the socially optimal level where we want it to be, where it's not causing as much damage to society. Um, so the reason parking is hell in this situation um, is because nobody's paying for it. And so it's naturally overprovided and it's too cheap, um, which stinks because I like free parking. Um, I don't like driving to downtown Atlanta and finding somewhere to pay to park. Um, but it keeps me from driving to downtown Atlanta all the time. Prior to the pandemic, I used MARTA all the time because I did not want to drive and park and deal with all of that. Um, and that's good. That's It was designed that way to prevent lots of people from accessing it because it's trying to get people to hit the socially marginal or the socially optimal level of, of driving downtown and parking downtown because somebody's bearing the cost of that now, me. Um, drivers have to pay the extra the extra fees for parking. Um, and then that reduces the amount of parking naturally. So in order to get somebody to pay for the externality, to get somebody to internalize the externality, there are three general solutions. You can use the private sector to do this. You can use the public sector to do this, or you can use kind of a market-ish solution, a mixture of the private sector and public sector um, to make it so some party um, internalizes the cost of the damage that they're causing. Um, so we'll talk about each of these in turn. So we'll start with private sector solutions. So there are three-ish three general categories of private sector solutions for externalities, and we'll talk about each of these here. There's merging and acquiring, there's natural governance, and there's this idea of Kosian bargaining, which you listen to in a couple of the podcasts here. So the idea of merging and acquiring is... Um, if you are a polluting firm and there are people downstream that are getting damaged from your pollution, if you buy them out, 
then that stops you from polluting because suddenly you own their firm and you don't want to pollute on your own stuff. And so suddenly you are now bearing the cost of your damage that you're creating. And so you will stop creating the damage. Um, an alternative is you can have the downstream firm buy up the upstream firm. So if you have fishermen and a factory, the fishermen could all collect money together and then buy out the factory and shut it down. Um, not fair at all that they have to bear the burden of that, um, potentially. Um, if you're the firm owner, you think that's super fair because it's free for you to pollute. And so it sucks to be them. They have to deal with it, um, which doesn't sound great. But um, again, it doesn't really matter as long as somebody bears the cost of the pollution. If you're the upstream firm and you buy them, um, then you're going to stop polluting on your own stuff. If you're the downstream firm, you're going to buy them and just shut them down so they stop polluting on you. In both cases, um, the cost of the pollution gets internalized. And so um, because the firm suddenly owns the stuff that's getting damaged, they're naturally going to stop damaging it because it hurts them. So that's one way of fixing it. Natural governance um, is another approach to fixing externality issues. This is basically letting the invisible hand take care of the issue. So if a upstream firm is polluting a whole bunch, um, then the market will punish them for unfair practices and they will stop buying from them. And then in order to sell their stuff, um, the firm will have to stop polluting and market themselves as a clean energy or a, a zero pollution firm. And that is how things get fixed. Um, this is the rationale behind things like um, fair trade coffee and fair trade um, chocolate and diamonds that aren't blood diamonds. Um, where those all cause negative externalities using all sorts of cocoa farming techniques that are fairly unethical um, or um, avocado farming or diamond mining. Um, those, have, those are associated with all sorts of, of murky ethical practices. And so in theory, the market should punish those companies and make it so that they switch their production systems so that they create less social damage. Um, so that, that's the argument for this and you just let the market take care of it. And the, if the market doesn't fix it and doesn't stop the pollution, then it's a sign that nobody cares. Um, and this has been an approach to fixing climate change, which is don't fix it because the market hasn't told anybody to fix it yet. And so as a result, we just keep hurtling towards more and more climate change. So this is, this is cool, I guess, um, because they get like polluting firms get punished by the market sometimes. Um, and so they internalize those costs and stop polluting because they want to have access to the market. But it doesn't necessarily work in real life. Um, most consumers don't actually care about um, free trade coffee um, or um, ethical diamonds or anything like that. They just buy whatever is cheapest. And so if you're using unfair labor practices to get really cheap chocolate, people are going to buy that um, rather than your ethical free trade chocolate. And so fixing that externality just with the invisible hand is fairly tricky. Um, the third way to use the private sector to fix these externality issues is to use something called Coasean bargaining, which is named after um, Ronald Coase, who was the economist that you heard interviewed in the Planet Money um, um, episodes. In this situation, what you do is you use the notion of private property and negotiations to fix everything with the externality. Named after this guy here, this is Ronald Coase. He died a few years ago. He's famous um, for this, this theory of fixing externalities. And so what you heard about in, the, uh, in one of the podcasts here is that you can use the Coase theorem to negotiate your way out of externality issues. Um, the example they gave in the uh, podcast is here, where if you have an airline passenger, if you're on an airplane in a non-pandemic time, you'll have people sitting in front of you and they might recline back into you. And that could be uncomfortable for you. And so according to Kosian bargaining, what should happen is one of the, or both of the parties, both the recline E and the recline er, or the reclined into and the recline er, they should negotiate to say, like, if you're the recliner and you want to recline, you can pay the person behind you like 10 bucks to say, sorry, I'm hitting your knees. Here's 10 bucks for your troubles. That fixes the externality because now somebody's bearing the cost of 
reclining. The person reclining bears the cost of that. Um, or if you are getting reclined on, you could reach forward and hand the person in front of you 10 bucks and say, I'm paying you to not recline. And then you are bearing the cost of the damage that would potentially happen if they were leaning back on you. So in the Kosian bargaining world, somebody's bearing the cost. It's really just an issue of negotiating who will bear the cost. Um, so there are two parts to this, two parts that make this work. If there are property rights, if, if you have the right to use your airplane seat and the person in front of you also has the right to use their airplane seat, then you can bargain and you can talk about it and you can figure out how to fix it. Um, if there are no property rights, if you're trying to get somebody to stop using the forest behind your back, behind your house and nobody has rights to the forest, you can't really negotiate on behalf of the forest because you don't have the right to. And so you need property rights for this to work. The second part of the theorem <clears throat> where it gets kind of controversial is it doesn't actually matter who has the property rights. Um, as long as somebody does, you can figure out a negotiation. So in the situation of, of an, airplane an airplane seat reclining or not, um, who has the property rights in the situation? It is unclear. If you buy a ticket, um, it comes with the button on your seat and that means you can recline. So theoretically, you have the property rights to do that. But also if you buy a ticket, you buy the space for your legs and for your knees and for your hands. And if that gets encroached on, then that's encroaching on your property rights. And so it's really uh, hotly debated. Um, in 2019, there was this big Twitter fight about um, airplane seat rights. And so um, there were, there's this article that was posted on Outside Online um, where this person argued that people who recline their airplane seats are monsters, um, which essentially argues that the person um, like the person has the right, or a passenger has the right to the space in front of them. And if somebody leans back, it's encroaching on their space. Um, but then this guy said, if you are not supposed to recline, why do you have a button for reclining? Um, and so in that situation, the recliner has the property rights. And so who should pay in this situation if you're trying to bargain your way out? Um, it's not clear. If you want to stop the person in front of you from reclining, then you pay them. If you want to buy permission to recline, then you pay the person behind you. Um, or you don't do any of this and just never recline, and that fixes everything. Um, so that's tricky. Another tricky situation is a parking lot. Um, when we were talking about having too much parking, who should pay to park? Should, um, should the drivers end up paying because they're the ones using the service? Or should the companies end up paying by not having um, so much parking or by pa paying extra fees or extra taxes per parking slot? Um, it's tricky. If you're trying to negotiate a parking spot with a, like at Walmart, that's going to be a really weird situation um, to engage in cosine bargaining to actually park somewhere. Um, if you have an upstream factory and downstream fishermen who needs to pay the other person in the bargaining situation. Should the fishermen have to pay because they're getting their stuff encroached on? Um, or should the upstream factory have to pay because um, they're the ones causing the damage? Um, it depends on who has the rights. If you're an upstream firm, you probably own the land you're on and you have access to the river. So according to this rule of property rights, you have every right to shove stuff into the river and let it go downstream. Um, which then messes up the bargaining situation where suddenly the people downstream don't have bargaining power and they have to basically pay you to stop polluting, which feels like a hostage situation, which is odd. Um, so it, it does create kind of, of, kind of weird situations here um, when you think about um, property rights here. Um, there is kind of s some general guidance for this that the UN has provided here. This is the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development that was um, a statement from some UN agencies in 1992 that essentially says the polluter needs to bear the cost of their pollution. So if you're a factory um, and you're polluting downstream, it's your responsibility to bear the cost of that externality. And so you should make changes. You should stop polluting. Um, this is also applied to countries in general. If you're a highly industrialized country with all sorts of factories that are polluting, then it is your responsibility 
to adjust um, your production or pay the countries that are getting polluted on, um, help with reparations, help with other issues. It's your responsibility as polluter um, to do that. One issue with this though, is that it feels fair at its core that the person making the damage should pay for it. Um, but an issue with this though, is it's a little bit more complicated than it appears. Um, and this is one major sticking point for all sorts of um, environmental treaty negotiations um, where company or companies, countries who pollute a lot should bear the, the burden of, of their pollution. That's, that's the whole point of this Rio Declaration. Um, but nowadays, if you're an old industrialized country like the United Kingdom or the United States or Canada or generally Western Europe, um, you've had hundreds of years to do to engage in all sorts of industry. Um, you've had lots of time to switch away from coal to nuclear power or to wind and solar. Um, you've had time and all sorts of government subsidies for creating electric cars and hybrid cars. And so it's easy for you to start reducing the amount of pollution you're creating um, because you've had like a 100-year head start, a 200-year head start. Um, so what we're left with is countries like India and China um, who have been later to uh, industrialize and get all sorts of polluting industries and cars and other issues. Um, and so when we're establishing this rule of who should pay, they are suddenly the countries that have to bear the cost of pollution because um, countries like the United States and countries in Western Europe have been able to reduce their pollution. And so they're not causing the most damage. And so according to this rule here, the polluter pays principle, we don't have to pay as much because we're not causing as much damage as India and Bangladesh and China and Southeast Asia because they're polluting more. Um, but they're polluting more because they haven't had a 200 year head start like we have. Um, and so it's, it's a trickier principle than it appears. Um, to just say whoever is polluting the most should pay the most for the damages um, because time is an issue um, and power imbalance is an issue. And so it's, it, there's no good answer here to who should pay. Um, so good luck figuring that out. There's no real good answer for this. Um, another problem we have with Kosian bargaining and who should pay who and who has rights over what is in a bargaining situation, you have to be able to assign blame um, and you have to determine who, who bears that blame. In the factory and fisherman situation, you could blame the factory for polluting and putting stuff in the river. You could also, if you're a really good corporate lawyer, blame the fisherman for being there in the first place. And it's their fault for fishing in that section of the river and they should just move. Um, and so somebody has to get the assignment of blame. It doesn't matter who gets it in this, in this bargaining situation. Somebody just has to get it and then has to deal with having the blame. You can also have issues with holdouts. If you're trying to negotiate out of um, the, the factory and fisherman situation, you might have a factory that's spitting out a whole bunch of pollution, hurting 100 fishermen downstream, and they come up with some sort of arrangement, um, some sort of a negotiation with the factory to stop but then one of the fishermen at the last minute can say, oh, just kidding, I want all of these other concessions. And if I don't get these concessions, then the deal's off. And they can veto the whole thing and destroy the whole agreement. And then the externality doesn't go away, um, which is a problem because we were trying to use this bargaining situation to fix the externality and then it doesn't work. So once you get lots of other players involved in these bargaining situations, things can fall apart pretty quick. If you're just negotiating with the person in front of you for airplane space, they're not going to veto you because you're making an arrangement. But if you have a ton of people all trying to argue, to come to some agreement with a polluter or something, one person can mess up the whole thing. At the same time, you can have free riders. So instead of having one person mess up the whole thing, you can have 95 of the fishermen not even care about the result and not get involved and just kind of sit back and wait for like a couple people to negotiate and then they'll complain about it if they don't like it. Um, so they'll under invest in, they'll be not as interested in trying to negotiate, which means it won't be a good negotiation, which means it won't solve the externality. Um, the last issue with this is you have all sorts of transaction costs. It is hard to negotiate and it is costly to negotiate. 
Um, with these international climate agreements, it takes years of preparation to get all of the different ambassadors and presidents and prime ministers on board to actually meet. And then they have to agree to a list of terms and they have to figure out the actual language and they hammer it out over years. Um, and it can it takes forever and it's really costly to do. And you run into holdout issues like the United States. We pulled out of the Paris Climate Accords in 2017. Um, and we essentially vetoed that whole thing because of our because of presidential policy um, and it messed up everything. And so Kosian bargaining sounds great and it works for these low level things. If you want to get your neighbor to stop running their lawnmower at eight in the morning, you can offer them to like offer them 10 bucks to not mow their lawn or you can offer to mow their lawn later in the day or if they're a conscientious neighbor they can come and pay you 10 bucks and say sorry i have to mow my lawn now because of work schedules here's 10 bucks for your trouble um, either way it kind of works out it's a low level way of fixing that negative externality of lawn mowing sounds but once you scale it up to big things um, like climate change um, or COVID-19 or any other big, major, complicated issue where it's really hard to assign blame and really hard to track what happens, um, Kosian bargaining doesn't really work. We're not gonna be able to fix climate change by bargaining our way out of it with individual countries and individual firms and polluters. Um, it's not gonna work because it's way too complicated and there's too many issues with holdouts and free riders and vetoes and it's just really costly and it's complicated. So if that doesn't work, how do we fix it? We've looked at some, um, we can look at the public sector to do this. Rather than letting the private sector just kind of figure it out through the invisible hand or through bargaining and paying people off to, to live with the pollution or to buy people out or to merge and acquire, we can use the government to actually set regulations that limit the amount of pollution or limit the amount of negative externalities we have. So the public sector can do this in a few different ways. Public sector can use regulations. Um, it can use something called Pigovian taxation, and it can use something called Pigovian subsidies. So we'll talk about each of these in turn here. So regulations. So let's say we have this situation here um, where we want to limit the quantity that is being provided. So right now there's too much pollution that exists in the market. We want to be back at this level. Um, because that's less pollution, it's better for society. So what we could do, we can actually pass a law that says you can only have this much level of quantity right here at 18-ish, and if you go beyond that, then it's illegal, and you'll face fines or prison time or something, make it so that people cannot go beyond that. So that means factories can no longer pollute um, up to a certain level, so they're limited. Um, and the nice thing about that is it basically shifts this whole marginal cost curve up to the social marginal cost curve and stops people from polluting. And it stops the dead weight loss that comes from the damage to society. Okay, so that is hard to do though. That is basically saying um, you have to somehow put like um, sensors on every chimney that produces um, emissions and as soon as it goes beyond a certain level, it shuts down the factory or they send in the feds or they do something to stop it. Um, and that's, again, really hard to do in practical terms. Um, but mathematically it works. You just say you cannot go beyond this point. Government says so, and that's the law. Um, another way of doing this without setting hard laws um, is to use something called Pigovian taxation. And it's named after this British economist named Arthur Pigou. He's British, even though his name looks French, and it is a French last name, um, but he was British. Um, his idea was instead of just saying, the government says you cannot produce beyond this number of barrels of oil or beyond this amount of carbon or beyond whatever, instead of doing that, the government can impose a tax. And if they tax the exact amount of damage that is caused by the production of barrels of oil or um, whatever is being made by the factory, then that will naturally reduce the cost or reduce the quantity and increase the price. And that's because of how taxes work. So if you remember, like if we have this level right here and the government imposes a tax of $5 per thing, what that will do is it will shift our marginal cost up by $5. And suddenly everything is going to be more expensive and there's going to be less of it. 
in a regular world, like with bread, if we tax bread $5 per loaf of bread, that's going to make bread more expensive and there's going to be less of it. And that's going to be bad for society. We don't want that. The cool thing about Pigovian taxation, though, is we use that idea where taxes reduce quantity and raise prices, but we use it in our favor. So if we know that this factory causes $5 of damage for every barrel of oil that it creates, we can put a $5 tax on that, on that oil. And so what that does is it moves this whole red line up to the green line. And then this is suddenly where they will be producing. They'll be producing at the right social marginal or at the right quantity and at the right price for society. Um, the reason this works is because it makes the firm internalize the externality. They are now paying through taxes the damage that they are creating. Um, so if they're creating $5 of damage per additional barrel of oil, they're going to pay $5 of taxes for that. And so they're basically internalizing those costs. That's going to make it more expensive and reduce the amount of stuff. So Pigovian taxation is cool because you use the principles of taxation, which we generally don't like because it makes things more expensive and makes less of them. Um, we use it to remove the damage. We purposely reduce the quantity and increase the price so there's less of it. Um, Pigovian subsidies work in the opposite direction. So a subsidy is just a reverse tax. So if you pay somebody, extra money to do something, they'll do more of it and it'll be cheaper. So if you subsidize some industry, so if this is science, for instance, this is what is currently being produced by the market, um, the amount of research. So it's, it's expensive and there's not enough of it. But if you can, if you know that for every research paper or every lab that is created or something, there's some amount of social benefit that society gets, maybe $5 of benefit, what you can do is you can pay or subsidize these um, scientists with $5 per lab or $5 per paper or $5 per whatever they're creating. And what that will do is naturally push their marginal cost curve down to the societal level, which means they'll be producing more stuff at a cheaper cost. Um, so it's, it's the reverse idea of taxation. You just pay the amount of marginal benefit that decide, that, or social benefit that society, get, society gets from the thing that you make. Um, and that shifts these curves around and it increases the quantity. It increases consumer surplus. It makes society better off by lowering it to that point, um, which is cool. So this Pigovian stuff, Pigovian taxation and Pigovian subsidies is where you get these firms or the consumers to hit the right amount by either taxing them or subsidizing them. And that will move those, those intersection points around so that you get the social ideal level of consumption and of production. Um, so Pigovian taxation and subsidies are pretty cool like that. There are some issues here though. Um, it is hard to measure harm. Um, we've been hypothetically saying there's $5 of damage per barrel that you um, create. Um, how do you figure that out in real life? Good luck. Um, there's no way of getting that perfectly right. Um, it's also really hard because there's different burdens of who's getting hurt. Um, consumers might be hurt more. Certain segments of the population might be hurt more. Um, marginalized communities especially. And so when you have situations like that, it's really hard to figure out the actual amount of taxation you need to impose um, or the amount of subsidies you need to, to offer to get at the right marginal level. Um, it's really hard to measure that cost too. You can use fancy statistics to figure out how much damage there is with each barrel of oil. Um, but again, that's, that's really hard. Power and politics also play into this. Um, the people who set the taxes are generally the people who have political power and they're going to typically avoid taxing the industries that donate to them and support them. And so it's really hard to get um, senators in oil rich states to impose taxes on oil refineries um, because they're their main donors. And so then it's really hard to, to get that taxation working and to move the social marginal cost up to where it should be. Um, and so it's really hard. It works cool. It works well in like an ideal world where you can measure everything perfectly and there's no politics, but we can't measure everything perfectly and there are politics. So good luck. 
Um, the final solution for this then, if public, if private sector stuff doesn't work well, public sector works kind of well if, if there's no politics messing stuff up, you can use something um, that's kind of in between the two. You can use this market-ish solution. Um, one of the most common forms of this is something called a cap and trade system. And if you pause this video here, and on the course website where you're watching this video, if you scroll down, there's this other YouTube video here that explains how the, this cap and tradable permit system works. So pause me, go watch this video because it gives a much better, more interactive um, animated version of how cap and trade works. So go ahead and pause me, go watch that and come back. And you're back. Hopefully you did pause me. Otherwise I sat there awkwardly staring at nothing. So with this cap and trade system, um, the way it essentially works is the government says we will allow a specific amount of pollution to exist in the world. Um, whatever the socially marginal, like the, the good social marginal or the good social quantity based on the social marginal damage that happens from too much pollution. And so um, back when we were looking at the other graph here, here, they, the government here would say we will allow 24 units of, or yeah, probably 24 there, 24 units of pollution to exist in the world um, based on what society should be getting. Um, so what they do is they issue permits. And so in this situation, we'll say the government allows 200 units of pollution, however we want to measure that. Um, cubic tons of air. I don't. The, there are ways of measuring carbon emissions. So we'll just say the government says there can be 200 units of pollution out in the world, um, and they hand out these permits to different firms. There are different methods for this. You can either just randomly allocate them to firms. You can have an auction for them and have firms buy up the permits. Um, but what essentially happens is you can only pollute if you have a permit to pollute. And so if you have two firms here, plant A and plant B, they each get 100 permits. So in this situation, the government just hands both of them 100 permits each and says, go to town. You can pollute as much as you want up to 100 units. Um, if you're plant A, it might be cheaper for you to stop polluting so much and to start abating pollution, to buy new equipment that doesn't emit as much carbon, to change the products you're making so they don't emit a much emit more carbon. And so you can actually not pollute. You don't need to pollute all 100 units of your pollution. Firm B though, might have, it might be too expensive for them to change their production processes or to change um, what they're actually producing. It's too hard for them to stop polluting. So what they can do is they can go over to firm A and say, I want to buy some of your permits so I can keep polluting. Um, and so they do. You, firm A can sell 50 of their permits to firm B, which means firm B can keep polluting, um, but firm A is not going to pollute as much. And so while this feels weird because this means one firm is actually going to pollute more, um, the other firm is polluting less. And so in aggregate, as you um, combine all of the different firms, they're actually going to hit the right level that the government set. They're only going to be polluting 200 units of pollution here instead of as much as they want. Um, and so as a result, there is less pollution in the world. The cool thing about this is pollution goes down while also maintaining flexibility. So firm A, they've decided that they can actually earn money by stopping polluting and changing their production processes and getting rid of some of their permits um, because it's it's cost effective for them. They can improve their profits by doing that. Firm B can't, they're not as flexible, but they can buy the extra permits so that they can keep doing what they're doing without hurting their profits. And so in the end, both parties are better off because of this cap and trade system, um, which is a, a cool way of, of kind of using the market here. They can still negotiate. Um, so we have the private sector side of this, but we also have the public sector side where the government says you can only pollute up to 200 units of pollution. That's the hard quantity. You can't go beyond that. But under that, figure it out amongst yourselves, do whatever you want, um, but just don't go beyond it. Um, this is happening all over the world in different um, countries. It's a fairly workable system. There's a whole bunch of research looking at how effective it is um, that's coming out. And in general, it works fairly well. Um, in New England, we have this thing called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. 
um, where these states have all kind of coordinated with each other to create a cap and trade system for pollution. New Jersey is partially colored here um, because they're not fully in it. They're kind of in with conditions. Um, there's also a thing called the Western Climate Initiative, which is actually kind of weird. Um, it is a combination of California and Quebec, um, where they have decided to create a, a carbon emission um, cap and trade system. And this, over the past couple of years, has actually run into some legal issues. Um, the Trump administration specifically has not liked um, California working with Canada over like using this cap and trade system um, because they're it's the Trump administration, but also it runs into some weird constitutional issues because you essentially have a state um, engaging in a treaty with another country, which is weird because generally like the federal government is in charge of treaties, not states. Um, so while it's admirable that they're doing this and, and having this cap and trade system, it does kind of run into weird sticky constitutional issues. Um, and that's, that's one of the reasons why it's been kind of held up in court. Um, Europe is pretty good at this. They have an emissions trading scheme um, where um, all of the European Union kind of pools their pollution permits together and they um, figure out the right level of, of permits and um, if they have a marketplace for trading those permits for different levels of pollution. Um, the United States as a whole, we were really close to having something like this. In 2009, there was a proposal for the American Clean Energy and Security Act um, which was a cap and trade system in the first year of the Obama administration. Um, but it was tanked and it did not pass um, because of a whole bunch of Republican opposition. It didn't actually work out. So we don't have a national um, cap and trade system in the United States. We do have regional ones and we have California plus Quebec for whatever reason. Um, and there are other newer regional uh, groups that have been trying to do their own cap and trade system. Um, maybe someday we'll have a whole nationwide cap and trade system, who knows. Um, but it did not work for Obama. Um, so this is cool, um, having this cap and trade system, but again, there are issues with it. Um, you have to face a trade-off here. You can reduce the damage immediately um, by changing how many permits you have. So let's say a country is currently emitting like a thousand units of pollution and they want to bring that down to like a hundred. They could immediately just say no more pollution except these 100 permits and fight amongst yourselves for the hundred permits. Um, and that's going to be great for fixing damage, but it's going to have all sorts of bad consequences. Firms are going to have to go out of business, the ones that can't adapt. Um, the ones that can't get access to their to permits are suddenly not going to be able to pollute at all, and they'll also have to shut down. Um, and so it can destroy like an entire industry, which is probably bad for the economy. Um, so instead, you can minimize the costs of doing that. So instead, you just, instead of dropping it down from 1,000 to 100, you say, here, we're at 1,000, we'll have 900 permits for pollution. And then after a while, take out 50 of them. And then after a while, take out 50 more and start shrinking that. And it gives firms more time to start adapting to um, the, the different levels of permits that exist out in the world. But that takes longer. And that means there's going to be more pollution created and more negative externalities and more damage and more health um, consequences. And so it's a slower process. Um, so this is the this is the issue that you have. You have you have quantity regulations that can be really expensive and can distort markets and can do bad things, but it gets the right level. Or you can use this cap and trade system where it, it does kind of, it, it, it allows firms to pollute and they'll adjust, but they'll continue to pollute unless you start pulling out some of the permits. And so it's a slower process. Um, it's less costly to individual firms, but that means there's going to be more marginal damage. And so your trade-off here is either reduce the damage immediately and hurt things, or go slowly and slowly hurt things um, to, to figure out the, to fix the, the marginal damage and the negative externalities. Um, which is the best of these three options? There's no perfect solution. They're all, they all have issues as we've just talked about. Um, it depends on the externality. It depends on how complicated it is. It depends on how large of a scale it is. If you have climate change, um, just relying on the invisible hand is not going to do it. 
Um, just relying on Kosian bargaining is not going to do it. Just relying on Pigovian taxation is probably not going to do it. Just relying on cap and trade also probably not going to do it. Um, it's going to have to be like everything all at once. And good luck doing that with politics. Um, but it, it's a tricky situation. So there's no good answer for fixing externalities. Um, there are a whole bunch of, of solutions that work in different situations, but there's no like magic bullet that will fix every externality. Um, and even if you can fix it fairly well, it's going to impose costs on somebody and there's going to be some inequity somewhere. Um, and generally, people with more power are going to benefit from different arrangements and different negotiations. And so it turns out to be a really sticky policy area. And this is why we have huge debates about um, environmental policy and other things like that. So um, now you know about them, but you're not going to be able to solve them because there's no easy way to solve them. So good luck with externalities.